Good afternoon. Let's just begin, I'm going to begin my time in prayer. So Heavenly Father, we just turn our mind, our heart, attention to your word. And Lord, we welcome you as you've already spoken. You speak today, but you've also already spoken. And so for that which you've already spoken that you want us to see and hear, I pray that you will help us open our hearts, our ears, our minds with a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. Father, I pray that you would cause your word to be alive. It's your word, it's your voice, it's your life. And we draw from you. In Jesus' name. Amen. For, for those that have been here for a majority of my times coming to Water and Wine, I emailed Travis um, this week because up until, well, I guess last month, with, for those that were here, what transpired in the Word, we had dedicated Sunday mornings or Sunday afternoons to my teaching on the fivefold. And we've been doing that other than one or two Sundays since we started almost a year ago. And I said to Travis, I just was discerning that the Lord was saying it's time for a shift, it's time for a change. There's a place to continue that study and teaching and all that, which is fine, but I just really believe the Lord was saying, I want a shift. And so he quickly echoed the discernment and the change of focus without us deciding on what the focus was. It was just, Lord, lead us forward. And so as I sat on this since our interaction, it's just, Lord, where do you want me to go? But I want just at the front end for those that have been here for the last season that we've been doing these meetings, or I've been coming to these meetings, we are shifting from where the focus has been to as the Lord leads, of course, but just so you know, for those that have been here, that the focus as this moment is going forward is not going to be where we've been. So in coming into today, my prayer, of course, Lord, where do you want to go? What's, if we're shifting in focus, where do you want to go? And I had an assumption of where that would take me, and my assumption turned out to be inaccurate, as is okay, because where I thought he was going to say he didn't lead, and where he led was not where I was thinking, so that's fine. So where we are going today, and I presume with what we're going to open in the Word today, this in no way will do, do justice to the study. Um, I have a book that I wrote, which is out on the display table, called Pray Then in This Way. And you'll understand why the title and the subtitle, The Greatest Prayer Model Ever Given. So you're going to understand why that title is what it is in a few minutes. In, so just I'll go back to the book in a minute. If you have your Bibles or for the overhead of the screen, I'd like us to turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And what I wrote in the book, it was actually at the front end of COVID as all the shutdowns were starting to happen and our whole world was changing. And right there, right at the front end of that, a very clear directive from the Lord came, I want you to write this. So the blessing for me, one blessing of the downtime of COVID was a shift of attention to work on this project, which now we're on the other side of that project, and now it's available. Um, but what I want to show you, and we're going to start, we won't finish, but I'm going to just go as far as I feel time is, is of comfort, and our brains are not oversaturated. But I want to start at verse 1, and I want to introduce basically what Jesus was doing. Now, a little backdrop here. Jesus, in, in the book of Luke, we're not going to go there, but the same moment in time, but in Luke's account, the disciples recognized Jesus would go and hang out with the Father and pray. Then he would return and they would see the kingdom of God all over the place, working. And after a period of time, they began to make this connection. You pray, something's happening. You pray, something's happening. So motivated by what they were seeing in Luke's account, they said, Jesus, teach us to pray. 
Now, that's a good student when the student is asking to be taught something and it's not the lesson of the day because you know what? Okay, today's class is we're going to learn about prayer. Well, actually, the classroom was motivated by the disciples seeing the connection that prayer and the kingdom of God moving were coming together with Jesus. So they were like, hold on a minute. If Jesus can do this, what would that mean for me, the disciple, to do this? So the motivation for Jesus to teach this was actually students ready to learn this. Man, if only every school or classroom was like that. And so I want you to see what he, what he did first here, because he sets the context. Because they were similar to, to our day in some senses. They were in a movement where the whole judo... Judeo, Jude, Jude, saying it wrong. The, Judeo, Jude, uh, <laughs> the Jewish systems and the structures coming from the Old Testament, where God was the author of an old covenant, but what the religious leaders did is they turned it into something beyond what God had intended it to be. So you have a purity in the sense of what God birthed. You had an impurity in regards to what man became in it. So pure birth, impure what it became. And what Jesus was doing here, which I'm convinced of, is he was actually training his disciples for what was coming after he finished his work on the cross. Now, I'm not going to show all that to you here. It's, it's, the evidence is there in the Greek language. We can't go deep enough today in time. But there's much of what Jesus taught in this prayer that gives the evidence, although there's going to be a portion of this lived out now, it's all pointing to when I finish my work, when I ascend at the right hand of the Father, when all that work is completed, this prayer will become a model of prayer from my finished work. And I'll show that to you if we continue down this road in, in future teachings. I'm just giving you the backdrop. So, so three things. The Old Covenant, purely birthed by God. It became, in this context, something that God didn't intend it to be. That's number two. And number three, this is a transition teaching them for what's coming, teaching us what has happened and what is to be ours now, if that doesn't lose you. For them, when he finished his work, this prayer was going to give birth to something in what would be the normal way to pray. For us, he has finished his work. It is teaching us today, living out what does it mean to pray. Okay, so if I didn't lose you on that. But let's start with, okay, the old covenant was birthed. I'm not going there. Now, let's start here at verse 1 of chapter 6. And I want you to see the context of what Jesus was doing with the religious leaders. Verse 1, it says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Now, this is leading into prayer, but this is a bigger principle than just prayer. Notice what he was identifying, and what he was identifying was the religious leaders of their day, is the motivation behind their leadership or their position was, I want you to see me. What mattered the most to the leaders that Jesus was addressing is that them being seen was what the Judaic system became about. Well, that has nothing to do with what the kingdom of God is about, but that's what man's heart did. Okay, so he said in that verse again, he said, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. The motivation was to be noticed. This is what he said. Verse 2, so when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets so that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. So what were they doing? Well, the trumpet was a symbol of drawing attention. So they're giving to the poor, beautiful thing to do, but while they're giving to the poor, they're making sure that everybody knows they're giving to the poor. The motivation wasn't, I care about the poor. The motivation was, I care that they see how spiritual I am that I'm giving to the poor. The motivation wasn't in line with what we're going to see from a prayer posture. The motivation was themselves. It was not walking in the purposes of God. So this is not a, oh, if somebody knew that you gave, 
you know, a can of soup to a poor person, dare you, you're in trouble. No, that's not what Jesus is dealing with. There's not to be a religiosity about this. He's dealing with the heart matter, the motivation of the heart. Sometimes we give, nobody has a clue. Sometimes we give, lots of people know, depending on what the giving looks like or what the giving involves. The question comes down to, what is the condition of my heart when I'm giving? Now, this is setting up the prayer teaching. Okay? Verse 3. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, again, the motivation of the heart. Hey, everybody, look at what's in my right hand. Do you see it? Do you see it? And you walk up to a poor person. Hey, I want you to see that I'm giving. It looks just so spiritual. You look, oh, look at that great person of God. They care so much about the poor. Well, that's what that person wants, is they want you to see how great they are in the demonstration of their giving to the poor. They're using a legitimate place for compassion and mercy to exalt themselves and to look good. Okay? This is what was going on with these leaders that Jesus was speaking about. Verse 4, so that your giving will be in secret and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now again, this is not about, okay, for example, I'm teaching. Do you see me? Do you hear me? Well, I'm giving to you out of my gift. I can't avoid the fact that you see me as I'm giving the gift. The question is, what is the motivation? And I'll be real. When I started in ministry, my dreams were all my dreams of being big and known. And everybody says, that guy is, however you fill in the blank. But obviously, I want them to fill it in nicely. My motive, being real was to have a big ministry, be famous, be well-known. It was all about me. That's how I, I mean, most of us start that way because it really often is all about ourselves. I had an experience with the Lord very early on in my, my active pursuit of Him, and in it I journaled a brutal thing. And He said to me, He said, Steve, the hardest thing in your life to die will be your reputation your need for your reputation. That'll be the hardest and last thing to die as I work in you. Well, a guy who wants to be known, wants to be seen, wants to be heard, that's all about reputation. Basically, God forewarned me, the journey I'm going to take you on, that's going to die. Well, I think, based on how the Lord has worked in my life, a lot of that, hopefully all of that, has died. I remember years ago, 25 years ago, we had just come to Nova Scotia. And I was getting involved in leadership in a local church in Truro. And there was a becoming well-known ministry in the nation coming into our region, just starting to become known. And leaders were gathering under the umbrella of this becoming well-known leader. And, and I have nothing negative about the leader. This story is not about him at all. But one of our prayer people called me up and said, Steve, have you heard of so-and-so? And at that moment, I'd never heard of this leader. They were new in the nation, more known out west, becoming known in the east. And they were. this was my first hearing about this ministry that's traveling in the nation, bringing leaders together, starting to do some, some neat things. And so they said, hang on a minute, let me go get the brochure. So they put the phone down. I'm on the phone waiting. They go find the brochure probably gone 30, 40 seconds, not long, but in the span of putting the phone down and them going and getting the brochure and back to the phone, the word of the Lord came to my heart. And he said this to me. He said, I want you to stay hidden. <laughs> well, that changed everything because now when this woman was telling me about this conference coming, you know, to the Halifax area and Steve, we all need to go and you need to go and all these great things. Well, now all of a sudden I have a word from the Lord that I have to honor. And the Lord said to me, or sorry, the, I said to her, I said, the Lord just spoke to me while you were getting the brochure. And I said, I have nothing to do with him. That word has nothing to do with him. That has nothing to do with you guys. I bless you. Go. But the Lord wants me to stay hidden. I can't go. Well, that was pretty humbling. One of our intercessor ladies got fuming mad at me. There's no way that God would have said that. 
He would never tell our leader to not go to a gathering with leaders. She was indignant. Well, years later, she apologized because she recognized what the Lord was doing and that that actually was a word from the Lord because of what he was doing in me. Now, I didn't come up with that word. I can't say I liked it initially, but it wasn't a word about me. It was a word that he was doing something in me. And quickly, one of the intercessors just slapped me with, you're wrong. That's no way that God would say that. Years later, realizing I see the fruit of why, because that staying hidden word went well beyond that ministry. It became a lifestyle that God was saying, Steve, I'm calling you to stay hidden because of things that I want to do in you and things I want to do through you, but much of them are going to be more hidden than visible. That's what I'm doing in you. Well, that didn't fit with the intercessor's agenda that believed that I was going to be this great man and do these big things in the region. They just didn't come together. Well, that's not my business. And part of it was exactly what God's saying here. You see, what I want is you to do it in secret and not care if anybody knows because who you're doing it for is the Father, not the people or the world, even though somebody gets the blessing of whatever you do. But I, I remember years ago, somebody gave a large donation to our ministry. One of the worst things that could have ever happened to me because when people found out about the donation, the person told me, I want to stay anonymous. I do not want anyone to know that I've done it. And so to honor this person, I will not let anyone know where this has come from. And it was given for a specific thing that ended up taking place years ago. Well, when people heard about the money that was given, everybody had their own agenda for what the money was for. And then somebody who by trade, vocation, found out about this donor's gift because they had a trade in the finance industry. And all of a sudden, everybody knew. Now I'm getting attacks. Now I'm getting accusations. Now I'm getting hit. And I still can't reveal the donor because I promised they, I promised them I will do nothing to expose. And this person got exposed. Not by my doing. It was ugly. And I think right there, the motive of this person's heart, God was protecting that person. God was protecting me and everybody's heart because he wanted it to be kept private because he was doing things that too many minds should not have opinions about. Now, I didn't know all that when she said no one can know, but I just honored it. So a guy with the word, I want you to stay hidden. A person with a large donation, I don't want anybody to know. It still had to be run through ethically and legally, the books and all that kind of thing. But keep it private and hidden. Well, I think God was trying to protect everybody because the enemy does not like it when gifts are given to empower certain things that the Father wants to do. And too many minds got involved. And it was, a police report was called because I was accused of stealing from this person. That's how far it went. Now I'm under investigation by the police because somebody concocted a story and had the police check out. I passed all the tests, thankfully, but that's how crazy it got. So when the Lord says, I want you to stay hidden, he says, do it. Okay, the, the point here isn't, is anybody allowed to know? No, the point is, what's the motive in the heart? And then sometimes these crazy words come where literally the Lord's trying to protect something. Stay hidden because I'm trying to protect something in you or protect something that I'm trying to do. And if you don't stay hidden, it's going to mess the whole thing up or someone else will mess the whole thing up. Let me show you just cross-reference here to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. Now, believe it or not, this is all about prayer. <laughs> doesn't seem like it yet, but this is the context to prayer of what Jesus is going to teach. So I'm just going to intro today the aspect of prayer and what Jesus taught. But Mark chapter 12, and I want you to see verse 38. Mark 12 and verse 38. And he said in his teaching, he was saying, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like respectable greetings in the marketplace. 
Okay, well, what do you hear there? Leaders who loved to be seen by other people and known for who they were. This is the motivation that Jesus was exposing, leading into prayer. And he said in verse 39, in chief seats in the synagogue and places of honor of banquets. You see, again, it's the position of the heart. Well, I deserve the best table, or I deserve to be seen by everybody. I deserve to be known by everybody. This is the leaders. And he said, the same ones who devour widows' houses and for appearance sake offer long prayer prayers and will they will receive greater condemnation. Now here's where the prayer sneaks in. For appearance sake, they offer long prayers. Now, what was the motivation of their long prayers? Connecting with God and his kingdom, seeing the kingdom of God manifest in our midst, was that the motivation? Or was it to, if I pray long enough, they're going to know how spiritual I am and they're going to know the position that I'm in and the great authority that I have. You see, the motivation was not to connect with the kingdom and see the kingdom of God manifest. The motive was about themselves being visible. And Jesus is saying, like, this is wrong. This is not prayer. And so let me, you, you can turn back to Matthew. Let, let, let me just take that statement that he said. For the sake of appearance, they pray long prayers. Well, now, now we're about to transition into prayer, but this starts to touch it. Religiously speaking in the church, we have destroyed prayer. We have messed it up. Some people would never dare pray in a public context because they'd be terrified of doing it wrong. Totally intimidated by the environment because they know how to pray, but I don't think I'm going to do it the right way. And some get that idea because they've watched people who don't know two clues about prayer looking spiritual, and they seem to demonstrate what prayer looks like. Well, there's the spiritual ones, and I'm not like them, but are they even necessarily modeling what prayer is from God's perspective? So religiously speaking, I believe, and I'm, you know, in, in this book and teaching, it's, it's shattering some, some fragile China that we've held on to in the church. But God has the authority to shatter things that are wrong. So his word should have the authority to tell us when something is wrong. Just like Jesus exposing the leaders. Guys, you're not in it for the kingdom purpose. You're in it for you. Well, I'm not pointing fingers at anyone, but think about the church, the body of Christ today. Do we know, and I'm not, no name is coming on the table, and I don't want you to say any names. I'm, this is just an evaluation at a heart level. Have you seen ministries that it seems like what's most important is the demonstration of what you see when they're in action? Uh, don't, no names. This isn't about identifying or not. Like, I'm not interested in that. That's not what my platform is about, is to teach the word. But I just want us to think from the context of what Jesus is saying. Have you ever seen ministries or leaders, and you know what? Why does it seem more like a show to you than it is about the authenticity of just God revealed? Anybody ever seen this before? Showmanship seems to be the driving factor. Okay, Now, again, I'm not here to talk about any particular ministry or leader. I just want us to bring Jesus' words into the now to say, hmm, is, is this motive in me? Got to be honest about it. Is my desires for, you know, the gifts that are in my life or the being effective in prayer so that people will see how great I am as a praying person or as a gifted person? Or is the motive, I just want God and his kingdom to be known and to be seen. And whatever my part is in that, whether it's visible or hidden, I don't care. Because the heart is for the kingdom of God to be seen. Not who was the one seen when the kingdom of God was doing whatever the kingdom of God was doing. So yes, God's going to still use people, but it's 
Who cares who is the one that that gift is being used? What matters, what that the motive that we want all to say, God, help this motive to become mine. The motive is, I don't want anything motivated by showing off so I'm seen. Now, you know, I teach something and suddenly someone gets a life-changing revelation. Well, there's a showing off there, but the showing off is God's word, not the teacher. Or somebody prays for someone and the power of God heals them in an instant. There's a showing off there, but not the one who prayed for the person that was healed. The showing off is that the power of God did something in a life and they were changed instantly. Well, you're going to be visible in some aspect when that happens, but what is the motivation of our heart? That's what Jesus exposed, that they were serving a system God birthed, but they were serving it in a false way, in a way that was not according to God. Now let's keep going here. Let's just I, want, I don't want to quit today before we open the door of the prayer aspect. He says, verse 5, when you pray... So here's the transition to prayer. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, you have your reward in full. Now we're moving into prayer. This is not a word that says if anybody hears you pray, then you're in sin. That's not what Jesus said. He's dealing with the heart. They loved to be seen, and prayer was a way to demonstrate their great spirituality. That's what they wanted. That's what they loved. And this, this is what Jesus was coming to explore. If you want to learn, disciples, how to pray, before I teach you anything about prayer, I'm going to talk to you about the heart condition that has moved towards prayer. Why did you ask me this, disciples, teach us to pray? Because you're going to be badasses. Everybody sees me because I pray and God moves. Yes! Is that what's going on, guys? And I probably presume it was, right? Sorry if you're offended by my language. It's true. It's, true. it's what's motivating. And I know, I mean, Jesus loved these guys. He didn't quit on them. He trained them. Okay? He developed them. He didn't reject them because their heart was wrong. He moved them to the right place. You want to learn how to pray, then let's start by let's get your heart in the right place. If you're going to be my man, disciples context, they were males, but if you're going to be my man or you're going to be my woman, then I want your heart to be aligned with kingdom. What is this all about? It's about God's kingdom manifesting, not about me being seen. That may happen. So be it if I'm seen. I don't care if I'm seen. I may be, I may not be, but what I do want seen is the kingdom of God changing a life and, and, and whatever my part is to see it happen, even if it's from a hidden place praying and nobody knew I was the one praying, so be it. God showed up. And that person was on their deathbed and that cancer left their body two weeks before they died. Who cares who did the praying laying on a hands? Wonderful. But who is worthy of praise in that moment? The only one that heals. So at the end of the day, if my hands were the ones used, beautiful. If they weren't used, so what? What I, my motive is, I want to see God revealed. Okay, keep going. Verse 6, but when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now I'll say it again. This does not tell us if somebody sees you pray, you've sinned. No, he's saying to a bunch of dudes who love to be seen, you want to really pray? Dudes, full robes, long prayers, showing off. Take off the robe, take off the mask, slow it all down to a few words, get in your room, shut up, and don't let nobody see you. Now, you know how quickly the leaders are going to hang around Jesus because he just changed the entire motive of everything they're doing, and he's just exposed their falsehood. Like just, I'm just trying to paint the picture for you because it sets the, the tone for what is to become normal kingdom living for every one of his children, which the prayer model is all about. So can you imagine how... Brutal those words were to a religious leader that his words loved to be seen. 
You say to someone that loves to be seen, get in that room and don't let anybody know what you're doing when you're in there. That is some aggressive, hard knocks to that leader. And you know, sometimes, and I'm just being real on this, when that word came, I want you to stay hidden. There was an aspect of that word that had to do with function and calling. So to this day, that word is still working. Okay? But there was an aspect of that word, as I told you at the beginning of my spiritual journey when I awakened to God in the early days, the Lord spoke this word to me and he said, Steve, the hardest to go will be your need for your reputation. So I didn't know what the journey is going to look like, but I knew that there is some time down the road when this thing called reputation was going to cease to matter. How do you get there? Only God can take you on a journey to get there. But the motivation is I want you to be there because now whether you're seen or you're not seen, it doesn't matter. You're part of my kingdom doing what I've called you to do. Now it doesn't matter. Verse 7. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetitious repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they'll be heard for their many words. So what was that? It was a religious show. If you get into, I do this in the book, I'm not doing it here, but if you get into some of the language that Jesus used here, do you know that he was actually using language that was words used to define a theatrical presentation? Like it's in the Greek, I'm not, I'm just staying at the top here, surface, but you know when you dive into the Greek language of what he said, he actually said to them, because they knew the language, he said to them, you guys are a bunch of actors on a stage showing off so that you can look good and be seen by everybody. He called them for what it was. I mean, phew, this is a tough hit on the leadership system of that day. But that's how, that's how hard he was in this regard to work to align the motive of the heart. I'm just saying what Jesus said. Verse 7, when you're praying, do not use meaningless repetition. Back to when believers come together. And may, maybe you're, you're a person right here. You are afraid to open your mouth. Because somebody is going to hear you and you're not going to do it the right way. That is the religious system that has destroyed prayer. That is not the heart of God. Now th this is, my, my wife's given me freedom to use her testimony in this journey. But years ago, I mean, she was so locked up, terrified of anything wrong. So there's no way that she would ever open her mouth, that there's no way that this hand would express praise because she was so bound in fear. Well, I take that picture, that's not the case today, but I take that picture and I present to you, it's possible that even as you hear me talk about this, that you're sitting right now bound in fear to open your mouth because the more spiritual are in your midst. That means, I'm going to tell you what it means, verse 7, when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition. That means that you have been influenced by something other than the Spirit of God that has taught you to be afraid to open your mouth. That's not come from God. If, you're, if your prayer, which again, we're going to get into what prayer is, but if your prayer is five words, but it came from the heart, there's no wrong, and there's no right. I, I shared this story in the book where, and I think I might have shared this here before, so I'm only going to just press into the final detail of it, but I was at an event, a leader didn't show up who was supposed to be there, nobody knew why, and two days into the event, he's still not there, family doesn't know where he is, he was there to be the speaker for the conference. And the Lord spoke to me, while we were in a prayer time, I went early to the service, and he said, I want you, so this is a word to me, but a word to the body. It wasn't a word to me directly. I want you to come together. The enemy has had an assignment to take out this leader. At this point, no one knows where the leader is. Two days into a conference, wife doesn't even know where he is. This is a crisis. The enemy took a shot at the leader. I want you to come join together and take authority over the enemy and deal with this. 
Okay? So the leader of the conference asked me, stop, praise, Steve, will you come? So I, I, my teaching exhortation was two minutes to tell everybody, here's what we're going to do. The enemy is taking advantage, and he's taking a shot. Nobody knows where the leader is, even his wife, his office staff. This is a crisis, and we're going to come together. We're going to join hands. Here's the scripture God gave me. We're going to speak it. We're going to demand the devil loose him now. Okay, so from me taking the mic, giving them the instruction, praying, and handing the microphone back to the leader, I, without exaggeration, can tell you the entire process played out in less than five minutes. Now, for such a big thing, you think we should have gone into hours of travail over a leader. But no, because this was spiritual authority amongst a, a band of believers who were to just make a demand and command the devil to let loose. We didn't even know what he had gotten away with, but we were just to exercise that authority. So we did it. I handed the mic to the leader, sat down, or went back to my seat. Praise continued. 20 minutes later, I see someone come and whisper in the ear of that leader. He gets up, and I'm like, <laughs> there's an answer. He leaves. He comes back, you'll love his opening line after the prayer and the word, and he says, you'll never believe what I just found out. What was that prayer about 25 minutes ago? And he said, all of a sudden, the leader was found. He was driving to the airport to fly to this conference, got hit by a car, knocked unconscious in his own mental capacity in crisis, went to the hospital. They didn't know who he was, but when he woke up, he realized he was in a hospital, and this is a man who walks in healing and teaches on healing, and he's like, this man, him, is not staying in this hospital, and he checked himself into a motel. He says, I'm not leaving here till I'm healed. Well, that's all fine if, if that's your walk with God, but you have a wife, you have an office staff, and oh, by the way, there's a conference that's two days in waiting for you. Something did go on in his head that the enemy took advantage of this mental assault, but all of a sudden when a band of 500 believers in less than five minutes made a demand on the devil, you get your hands off him, we loose him from your hand. Now God, you release him. It was done so quick, and all of a sudden the man was found. He's walking to this day in his ministry doing what God called him to do, and a band of 500 believers were used to free him from an assignment the enemy had. Now guess what? I've never called the man and told him what we did. I've never been asked by anybody to come and lead a conference based on what we did. The Lord said, I want you to stay hidden. You see, that moment over that leader was a hidden work. It wasn't, I mean, it was 500 saw, but it wasn't visible to the overall body of Christ. We better tell everybody what happened and make sure they all know. I told nobody. In fact, the leader of the conference that handed me the microphone Never heard from him again. It's not my business. But we did what God called us to do, and we freed a leader who to this day is walking in a much richer fullness of his calling today than he was that day that we went to hear him. Praise the Lord. Okay, so again, what, what's the motive here? So if God chose to use that to promote something, that, that's fine, that's his business. You know, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, First Peter 5, but listen, that he may exalt you at the proper time. God does exalt. Nothing wrong with that. What's the motive of the heart? And oftentimes God won't exalt until the heart's in alignment with the kingdom purpose because when the exaltation comes, if it's been done by man and the heart hasn't been aligned, the exaltation will corrupt the man or the woman. So to protect everything, God won't exalt, will exalt, I got a great marketing campaign. Say nothing, tell nobody. <coughs> Jesus had a great marketing campaign. They either came at him to hate him, he shoot him off with truth, or they came at him to receive from him, they received the kingdom. He had a great marketing campaign. They came from the region because his, the work of the kingdom was what was visible to the enemy to attack it, from the needy people to receive from it, visible on both fronts, but not from some marketing campaign. It was the kingdom at work that caught, the campaign was the kingdom of God revealing. And the enemy showed up because he hated it. Woo! 
you got yourself a show, but not a man-made show. You got a show that the enemy's creating through his opposition or a show that God is creating through all the people's lives that have been healed or changed. That's a great show. Okay. If you are afraid to open your mouth in a prayer context, I'm just going to end it with this, and end that part with this. You've been duped by religious fear that is not from God. Okay, just to, to, just to flatline this point, if you are afraid to open your mouth, you've been duped by the re religious fear, and especially if you're afraid to not do it the right way, something else is motivating you speaking or not speaking. I'm afraid of doing it the wrong way. I'll leave it at that for you to wrestle with the Lord. Okay, verse 8. So do not be like them. Pretty, pretty strong statement. So now he's transitioning to the disciples in the moment and to us. It's so all that I just said, Jesus speaking. All that I just said. Here, here's my opening. Okay, now the introduction's done. Don't be like them. That's not prayer. That's not the kingdom of God. That's not what the kingdom of God births. Don't be like them. And so if we've been duped by religious fear, that's not from God. Don't be like them. And, and, and I realize the influences are what they are, but, but really the word comes down, then, then it's time to start working at shaking it off. Because when God gives us things, we should not be religiously afraid to use those things. Now, there's a right time and a right place to use our giftings, but we should not be afraid to release what God has given. So he says, don't be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. Now, here's the transition right into prayer. The question that, that should be asked, that should become a motivator, is why pray? Why is prayer even important? Well, especially when you take here the words, your father knows what you need before you ask. Okay, well, let's just pause and reflect. If he knows what I need before I ask, then why isn't he doing something about what he knows? Let me say that again. If he knows what I need before I ask, then why is he not doing or meeting the need that he knows I have? It's a very fair question. Like There should be nothing wrong with asking that question. Well, it really comes down to do two different rules of thought or ways of thinking. If you are in, in the mental disposition that God is in control of everything, well then, just sit back. And wait, because he knows, and I'm not questioning the all-knowingness of God. He knows. So when, when he knows it's time, he'll meet the need. Or he knows you shouldn't have that, so he won't meet the need. This is how we religiously explain. Prayer's not being answered. Well, he knows what's best. I hate that. I don't disagree with that, so please, I, I don't hate the words. I hate the excuse it's making. Because basically, do you know what? Okay, let's, let's just be real. When I met April, and she was coming from her sexual abuse background, and she started to really get alive to her hunger for God. Naturally, one of the most significant first questions for her, why didn't you stop him from doing that? And until she could settle that, how could she abandon her heart to a God that loves her? Well, I knew you needed the lesson, April, to be violated that way, so I loved you enough to let that lesson happen. Now, if that's true, and I'm not telling you that's true, that is false, but if that was true, how hard would it be for her to open her heart to say, God, I want you? There's no way. Because ultimately, the, the fact in her thinking is God is at fault for the abuse that I went through. Now, that is a lie from the pit of hell, but religiously, it's been presented as a truth that we've adopted. And, and in that window of time, 
being in the church world that she was, that's all she knew to think because that's how we explain the unexplainable. Well, when God's silent, he knew you needed to learn that. You knew, he knew you needed to experience it. It's going to make you a better person. He knew you would have enough grace to endure it. Have you heard of any of these lines? And do you know what they are? They're a bunch of excuses because the truth is, there's another side over here where God actually, if you dig this up, which today I'm not going to do justice to, but if you dig it up, we're going to find out over here that prayer actually plays a part in determining things that God does or doesn't do. Because God has equipped us with something, in this case prayer, to bring the influence of his kingdom into the everyday world. So when I stand back and I'm over here saying, well, you know, God knows what I need, so whenever he wants to meet it, it'll be taken care of, then I'm in no way going to be a person saying, teach me how to pray. Teach me how to see the kingdom come and change things. Teach me how to, to, to pray in such a way that what the enemy got away with, I'm going to get healed from you. For? Teach me how the kingdom works. You're not going to be on that road of learning when you're sitting back saying, well, God knows. And imagine if that day I said to April, well, you know, April, I really can't explain this. God knew it was going to happen, and he loved you enough to, to, to be there with you as you're being violated, and he loves you today. And, and this, imagine if this was my counsel to her. No, quite opposite, the first thing she had to deal with, and I helped her on this point, God had nothing to do with this. The enemy and the flesh of man had something to do with this. God had nothing to do with this. He is the healer and the deliverer of what the enemy got away with. But don't put what the enemy got away with on God. That's the first thing she had to settle. Because how will she ever say, teach me how to pray? If God's in control of all things, and that means the violator violated me and God was in control, so that means at least indirectly God's responsible for this horror in my life that's taken so many years to recover from. This is what we've religiously done. So even that makes the approach to prayer difficult because we're so confused in our minds why prayer even matters because we, we really don't know. And I'll tell you, for years I would read, well, God, if you know what I need, then why aren't you meeting it? Because you know how bad I need it. Why aren't you doing anything? Because if you know, that says enough. You should be doing. But he didn't end there. Because he said, don't be like them, verse 8. Your father knows what you need before okay, you ask him. Then look at the next line. What's it say? Somebody shout it out. Pray then in this way. In other words, Jesus is saying, okay, let's, let's settle one thing. The Father knows everything you need. He knows everything that's right. He knows everything that's wrong, everything that's broken, everything that happened. He knows it all. But now here's what prayer is going to do. Prayer is going to connect you to the one that loves you enough to lead you down the road of deliverance. But if you don't learn the role of prayer, then the one who wants to deliver you from the things he knows has to sit back because he's given prayer as a piece of the arsenal for the believer. So he's saying, guys, you're going to have to learn how to be praying people to deal with the enemy that's gotten away with things. I know everything, and I know enough to know how to help you, but you've got to bring me into it. Prayer is a key to bring him in. I, first time I did this, <laughs> Let me give you this story. This is great. I was, we were doing some Zoom meetings. We had a group. And I was on this meeting. And I, touching on this particular part of this subject, I identified, I've written a couple chapters in this book on it, but I identified God is not in control of all things. So I identified it. I was speaking to that point. I made the statements. Well, this woman got offended. I didn't know. She was in a living room many miles away. She was just part of the meeting. So I got a rebuke email from her. And she emailed me to let me know the wrong that was coming out of my mouth because, come on, Steve, God is in control of everything. That was her posture and why she rebuked me. Well, I was going into a session with somebody by Zoom. 
I saw the email and I only got the first line because I was on the edge of being late for the appointment that I had with someone. And I read the first line and I could tell the essence of it was she's rebuking me and I saw the essence of why. I didn't have time to read the whole email. I could only read the first sentence and I saw it. Boom, the Holy Spirit rose up in me and he said, shepherd her in that. That was fast. So I quickly typed, I'm going into a session. I don't have time to read your full email. Do you have a window of time later today? I would love to meet with you through, praise God for Zoom or this technology. I'd love to meet with you. Does that work? So I'll check my email when I get out of my session. I check my email, she's available. So her and her husband are now sitting in their living room. I'm sitting in my studio, got cups of coffee, beautiful, casual time. And all I'm doing, I said, let's, now I've read her email. I said, let's just open the word. So I didn't even address the rebuke. Let's just go on a word journey. And let me show you what the word says. So for two hours, in every scripture she had to read, for two hours, we just, I didn't know where we're going. The Holy Spirit, next, 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 next. And we just boom, 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 boom. Two hours, she's been reading the scriptures. I've just been guiding the process and seeing things that contradicted her worldview that God was in control of everything. And it was the most precious moment. All of a sudden, oh, Steve, I'm wrong. I'm like, this is the first time I'm really starting to appreciate this technology as this woman was on the edge of screaming because the revelation after two hours broke through a mindset that she didn't know. She was now sitting back waiting on God to be whatever he is because he knows everything. So come on, God, do it. And he ain't doing it. Of course not. And her part in it wasn't part of the equation. And all of a sudden, but she was here screaming, ah, this is amazing. This is so fun. God breaking through at her point of need. And, I, and I, it wasn't me just talking, talking, talking. It's read this. Tell me what it says. Oh, let, let me tell you what it, that says in the Greek. Let me just give you that insight. She's taking notes. And just two hours. We hit that last scripture. And the scream. Oh, Steve, I'm wrong. I've never had anybody change their mind. That's, that's what's called repent. Repent, biblically, metanoia, the Greek, simply means to change your mind. So when truth hits you and you change your mind, you change your mind. Now, if you change your mind and it aligns with truth, you're going to move a little bit differently. You're going to go in a different path. So repentance will have fruit because I'll tell you, this woman, seen her many times since, and we've joked about it many times, about that dramatic when she yelled out the discovery. But I, I said to her, you just repented? And we didn't have some crazy spiritual service. You're in your living room, finished a cup of coffee, and you just repented because your mind changed to what God says. And she was free to start a new journey because she began to see, oh God, you're not in control of all those bad things and just we just need to learn all these lessons. You're not. Okay, Jesus said this. Let's take it for real. He says, the thief comes, John 10, to steal, to kill, destroy. Okay, three qualities of the enemy. Steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, but I have come that you might have Life, and life more abundantly. Okay, I don't think we can get more of a contrast of worldviews. So over here, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Oh, you know, God wanted you to experience this trial because you needed to learn something. Um, how about the thief hates your guts? And he'll steal everything he can from you if he can get away with it. And he will destroy everything God plans for you, if possible, within his power of influence. That's the enemy. Jesus made it clear. Just in case you wonder the difference between us two. Just in case your mind defaults to blame God for the stealing and the destroying. Just so you don't default, I've come. Change it. Prayer has come to lead you into life and life more abundantly, because the believer has a part to play in the authority of the kingdom being revealed in our everyday life. So when sinful man does sinful things, then I am affected by it, or when the enemy moves like the violation in my wife and she was affected by it, we need to settle flat out the thief, the stealer, the destroyer, through sinful flesh was at work. 
to keep her from ever being who God intended her to be. But Jesus showed up, identified the thief, and he wasn't the thief, he was the deliverer, and he showed up to show her that I'm your deliverer, I had nothing to do with this, now turn to me because I want to help you get delivered from what the enemy got away with. In comes prayer. So, Jesus said, the Father knows what you need before you ask. Pray, then, in this way. In other words, scary to say it this way, he said there's a right way to pray and there's a wrong, and there means there's a wrong way to pray. Well, he exposed the hearts. That was wrong. So right there we have a heart condition that can be wrongfully influenced in prayer. So there's things that are not right according to God's plan. And so I said to you, you'll hear in a few minutes, why I wrote the title of the book, Pray Then In This Way. Because it's taking what Jesus said to, well, if he said, pray then in this way, then I want to learn what he said, I am to pray in this way. And then I call it, subtitled, the greatest prayer model ever given. Because Jesus, no one can teach prayer better than him. Now, some have disqualified Matthew 6, back to the beginning of where I started, some have disqualified Matthew 6, because there's language in here. This is where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slow down and come to an end, okay? But I want to give you food for thought. Because we can be here till tonight and tomorrow and we keep on going. Okay, that's just the reality of this subject, okay? But Jesus, there, there's some that will teach this prayer is not relevant to the new covenant believer. And the reason... And for this reason, I would support their conclusion. It's just I believe the reason's wrong. But I would support the conclusion for this reason. There are things in this prayer language that doesn't reflect the new covenant reality of who we are in Christ. Okay? Now, I'm not going to open the can because that's what we've got to go line by line. But there are some, I just want you to hear this because some may potentially, you may hear this from another source. The language that we have memorized by traditional reciting, much of it is not reflective of what's literally in the Greek. And so when the authors from a sorry, when the scholars from a religious perspective translated this prayer that even non-believers can recite, they're not and we're not necessarily reciting what Jesus really said when you dive into the and let me just, just to tickle your appetite, let me just show you one example. Okay? In the prayer, look at verse 13. Now, I'm just going to let the words speak for themselves, and I'm going to contradict the words by new covenant reality. It says, verse 13, do, and do not lead us into temptation. Now, think about this. I'm, I'm not drilling in here, I can't. I just want you to get this perspective so the thinking is in front of you as you reflect on this. I just said to you, Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. Anybody disagree that that was Jesus speaking? Okay, many other scriptures where we're told, okay, having done all to stand, stand firm, resist the enemy. Submit to God, resist the devil, he will flee. Okay, James talks about that there is no sin or no darkness in God. He cannot be tempted and he cannot tempt. James chapter 1 and 2. I can just recite many new covenant scriptures. Well, hold it a minute. Jesus told us to pray, Father, don't lead me into temptation. Does that sound consistent with what you know of God in the new covenant? No. And so this is a good example as to why some would say this was a Transition prayer, not a new covenant prayer. And for the reason of that, I would agree, except that what we didn't do is dive in and say, hold on a minute, are what we're reading on the surface true? Is that really what Jesus said? And let me just, again, just to tease your understanding, when he said, he, when, when we read the words, don't lead us into temptation, there's a Greek word there that was used, which is a word that defines the cessation or the ending of something. And basically, the prayer is, is to simplify it without going further. God, I thank you that I know you will never lead me into temptation, but you will deliver me from the evil one. You see, it's not a prayer, oh, please, God, don't lead me today into temptation. I don't want to fall in the pit that you set up for me. 
That's not God. And that's not what his word says when you dive into the Greek. It's actually, it's a negative when you get into the Greek because we're agreeing with the character of God that Jesus revealed. He's come to give life. And so I'm not going to be begging my God, seated with Christ in the heavenly places at the right hand of the Father. Hey, God, as you're listening, I'm over here with Jesus seated at the right hand. Please today don't lead me by way of temptation. Please don't let it be today. And then you wake up tomorrow. Oh, please don't let it be today. Can you imagine if this is the New Covenant Believer's Prayer? Well, it's not. The Greek language reveals the translation, I believe, has been written from a religious mindset, not reflective of the New Covenant truth. But the Greek itself changes the picture of what was going on. So I can't, I can't dive into the teaching on that. I'm giving you an example. Some will therefore say, because when you read it at face value, there's an example. This is inconsistent with the New Covenant. Well, I'm agreeing that that I just presented is inconsistent with the New Covenant. But actually what Jesus taught from the Greek perspective was not what we're reading. So Jesus' teaching was consistent with the New Covenant. The religious words we're used to reciting, they're just not in line with the present and the future work that Jesus was going to do. Now, I can't go any further because that, that's all. I guess we could just open up that can and dive in. Okay? I said we're going to bring this to a close. So let's, let's close it by opening a door. He said in verse 9, pray then in this way. Okay? In other, in other words, with everything that I've shared with you that's not right about the religious leaders, don't be like them. I know everything you need. Pray then in this way. And here's what he did without diving now into each phrase. He opened up an aspect of what is involved in prayer that when principally speaking, they are understood. They literally affect every day of our life because I'm driving down the road. This is my prayer, the principle of what he taught. I'm in a quiet time with the Lord. This is my prayer, or the principles of what he taught. You see, what he did is he opened up facets. Now, presumably next month we'll dive into this. Let me just, again, I said I'm going to open the door. I'm concluding with opening the door. First part of prayer. He said, hallowed be the name of God. So what did he really say there? First of all, and we'll, we'll, we'll revisit this in, in more teaching, but what did he say there? He, he said hallowed, which is a word to set apart or to acknowledge. What does that mean? Well, at the front end of prayer, I am acknowledging who's out front. Isn't that a contrast to what he saw, said the religious leaders did? Who was out front for the religious leaders? Themselves. So Jesus says when you pray, the first thing I'm doing, you see, this is about serving the king, God and his kingdom, not serving the kingdom of me, the kingdom of him, which means the first thing I'm doing in prayer in any context, Father, I, I, I acknowledge you as the greatest. I set you apart. You are it, Jesus. I love you. You are the head. You were like setting him apart because, well, we won't go there, but Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added. In other words, when God has his way in the life of the believer, he adds to us deliverance, transformation, victory of every kind. So why would you not want to acknowledge him as number one? Later in the prayer, he didn't say, oh, pray today, I don't lead you into the pit of the enemy. No, that's not what he prayed. So it starts with, Father, I just acknowledge you. Now, that, it can be as simple as that, or it can be deep as a vibrant praise time. It doesn't matter. This is why I said sometimes it could be five words. Father, I just acknowledge you for who you are. You're amazing. You're incredible. You've just entered the doorway of prayer. Now, how scary is that? How religiously intimidating is that? No meaningless words. It's a heart putting God out front. Okay, So I'm opening, but I'm closing. I'm opening the door to show you the incredible simplicity and life impact that I can realize, you know what? Paul said, I pray without ceasing. I get it. Because first of all, praising God or loving him or acknowledging, it becomes breath. 
I don't know about you, but I'm in the grocery store and all of a sudden, praise you, God. Have you ever just uttered praise in the grocery store? Have you ever uttered just simply, God, you're, I love you, or God, you're amazing, just while you're walking down the street? Have you ever, when you're just lying in bed and not quite asleep, oh, God, you're so amazing, I love you. Have you ever breathed praise? I know we breathed, but have we breathed praise or breathed acknowledgement that he is out front? You have opened the door to the way Jesus said to pray. Does that sound scary? Does that sound intimidating? Does that sound like, oh, I'm scared because I can't do it the right way? There's no right or wrong way to just acknowledge you're out front, you're amazing, God. And you're going to say it differently than me. My way isn't more right than yours. Your way isn't more right than mine. It's the heart that just says, God, the more I get to know you, I just want you to be out front. And I know in your goodness that means you want to do amazing things in my life, but that's not what this is about. It starts with just acknowledging you for who you are. Welcome to opening the door of prayer. That's what Jesus did right there. Does that sound intimidating and scary and religiously? Oh, or sign me up. I want to become a prayer like Jesus taught. I close with the way I opened. I think, religiously, we've messed up prayer in the church. We've damaged it. We've made it confusing. We've intimidated people, chased them away. And what Jesus is opening after we get the heart in alignment with the kingdom, what Jesus is, is opening is the simple reality. When you learn to pray this way, you will learn to bring my kingdom into every facet of your life. When our son, I close with this story, when our son, he's about 12, he was playing with his friends, boys will always be boys. And they were riding a bike, set a jump, videotaping, and they decided, this is going to be the last one, so let's do a biggie. So my son was the one doing the biggie, and two brothers were the one filming the biggie. Well, they deleted the biggie because of what happened. So the incident happens. I'm at home. They're up the road. I'm mowing my lawn. Nothing spiritual. I walk in the door. As I get in the door, still sweating, just finished, my phone rings, and it's the mother at this house. And the mother says, I think your son has hurt himself. Very calm in that tone. So in my mind, I need to clean myself up, drive up to their house, grab his bike, throw it in the vehicle, help him get home. That, that's my image, okay? So I go into the shower. I just finished mowing and I stink. I got 50, I'm not in a hurry. He may have hurt himself. So that's the image that I have. So I finish, 15 minutes-ish. We walk out the door. I go up. He's in the kitchen, and he's sitting on a chair, and he's holding his leg, and when I see him, his foot is turned sideways. Well, I think he may have hurt himself. <laughs> and I think my shower was uncalled for. I think everything just changed. And I've, been a I've been a firefighter for years. The good part of that is I didn't freak out. Reacted just like we're coming up on scene. So that part was good. But immediately, uh, we got to get him now. So in that state, we get him to the hospital. He's sitting in the foyer. We're waiting for triage. He's sitting there for half an hour, crying, of course, in such agony. Finally, I go up to the triage. Can I tell you something? My son's foot is turned sideways. He is in agony and in pain. <gasps> and she runs out. They see him. They whisk him in. Well, they did a couple x-rays, gave him some pain meds, thankfully, just to knock down what was going on. They gave him a couple x-rays, took me in to the screen, two doctors, and they said to me, you better buy a cheapest car you can get for fuel economy because you are going to be doing a lot of trips to the city. We're in Truro, Halifax, an hour and 20 minutes to the hospital. You get a cheap car because you're going to be doing a lot of trips to the hospital. So an ambulance takes him to the city. We go to the sick kids. We get there. It's two-ish in the morning. We walk in. They've got him drugged, thankfully, at this point. 
and so the doctor, the surgeon, they called him, got out of bed, came for this incident, and he said to me, he says, what I'm going to do is we're going to give him a med, knock him right out. Now, when I do my manipulation, he's going to wake up, but then he's going to go right back to sleep, and he'll remember nothing. And I have his x-ray, so I'm going to do my best to align his foot now, and then tomorrow at 11 o'clock, the chief surgeon is going to do his operation and pins and rods, and here we go. Okay? He then says to me, do you want to stay while I do that? No, thank you. <laughs> my son is going to wake up screaming, and I'm just going to hang out and watch. No. April and I, with the simplicity of what Jesus taught, went out in a back alley. It was dark, 2-ish, 2.30 in the morning. I don't even know where the alley is to this day because it doesn't matter. It was our secret place to meet with God. And we joined hands. And our prayer was not long, but it was fervent and it was clear. And we prayed what Jesus said to pray. Out there, minutes. We go walking back in. This surgical procedure was only going to be minutes. Just snap, crackle, pop. We're done. I walk in, and the machine from his room had already sent it to the machine in the x-ray room. And so I, as I'm walking down the hall, April wasn't quite as quick to follow that stuff she doesn't do too well with. So I'm, I'm walking towards the technician or the, the nurse, and I see her. That's beautiful. Wow, that's beautiful. And I don't know what she's looking at. Well, she's looking at my son's foot. And so the surgeon crosses the hall onto her right behind her. He looks just over her shoulder. Wow. Says, what do we see? I don't know what we see. And he just said, it's, it's perfectly lined up. So we'll see what the surgeon says at 11 in the morning. Well, 11 o'clock, the surgeon, the chief surgeon comes, they re-x-ray him. And here's what he said. He didn't have the full God perspective of it, but here's what he said. He said, Dr. So-and-so, flawlessly aligned everything into perfect alignment. I'm canceling the surgery. As long as it holds in that position for the next few weeks, I don't need to put anything in there. He does not need anything. He just needs to naturally heal. They canceled the surgery. He was in there for a few days. Our word to him is, it sucks, it's summer, but you better lay low. Because here's what happens if you don't. Well, you know, to this day, he's never had an issue with that foot. Now, all we did in that crisis is we did what Jesus said. Pray then in this way. And I tell you, we didn't have a lot of words because there's a lot of emotion in a crisis like that. But we made contact with a deliverer a kingdom, and a God who wants to deliver. There was no religious garb in that back alley. There was a Jesus way to pray, and we thankfully that night made contact with the kingdom of God. That's the God that wants to teach us how to pray, and he loves every one of us to lead us from the, into deliverance from whatever the enemy has gotten away. But Father, thank you. Your word is alive. Your word is rich. Jesus, you are the greatest teacher, and we're just sitting under your feet as the teacher. Thank you, Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that this would become a catalyst to open a door concerning prayer, and even perhaps start some kind of new prayer movement, because that's your heart, Father, that you want the body of Christ to arise in our place of prayer. So thank you, Lord, for how alive your word is in Jesus' name. Amen.